The alien warlord waited for the ship's ramp to touch the edge of the tower and stepped onto it, making another complex gesture with his hands as he backed away. Our civilizations will cross paths again, said Sicarius. That I promise you, alien, and on that day, there will be blood. I am sure of it, said the Xenos warlord sadly, turning and walking slowly into the craft as it drifted towards the stars. Greetings friends and welcome to the Imperium's Most Wanted. I'm Lorcan, and this is Only War. In this second part of the tale of Commander Farsight, we take in the events of the Damocles campaign and the defense of Dalith. Commander Oshova's path will continue to be hampered by the political maneuvering of those around him. Despite ultimately achieving a fated victory on Arkunasa, that campaign showed how tenuous his position could be. The enmity of his former tutors will not yet abate, and, foreshadowing events to come, he will continue to wrestle with the demons that stoke his inner rage. The beast within of Oblatai's dying words. Farsight himself has only shown the faintest hints of questioning the wisdom of the Ethereals. He can't deny they are hiding information from the Firecast that could aid their military objectives, but he can justify their decisions as part of the Tau Va. This faith will be tested further during the Damocles campaign. From the Arkunasa campaign, he has an uneasy relationship developing with the genius Earthcast scientist Elvesa and has gained the admiration and loyalty of Admiral Teng of the Aircast. And with his protege, Commander Brightsword, still by his side, he looks to learn from the mistakes of Arkunasa, as he and the Tau race face an entirely new threat to their goal of conquering the stars. Before we get started, thank you to everyone who helps the channel grow by liking and commenting on the videos and subscribing for more, especially my supporters on Patreon. If you're new here, thank you for joining us, and I hope I earn your subscription today. The invention of the ZFR Horizon Accelerator Engine enabled the Tau to make what is seen as the last major breakthrough of the Second Sphere expansion successfully crossing the Damocles Gulf. Situated in the galactic east, corewood of the Tau Empire, the Gulf had long thwarted all attempts by the Tau to pass through. The ZFR Horizon Accelerator Engine allowed the Tau to achieve near light speed for the first time, thereby circumventing the previously unnavigable space phenomenon and the malevolent entities that dwelled there. Once on the other side of the yawning interstellar anomaly, the Tau swiftly established outposts and colonies, and soon made contact with the single largest power in the galaxy, the Imperium of Mankind. The first humans they encountered were dissident elements, living on the fringes of the Imperium's sprawling borders. Long lost colonies with little connection to their distant home world were quickly annexed, but as they pushed deeper into the Imperium's incomprehensibly large galactic empire and encountered planets still bound to their oaths of loyalty to the Emperor, they realized a new tack would need to be taken. Still unaware of the true power and vengeful nature of the Imperium, the ethereal Anvar masterminded a campaign of ingratiation and integration over decades with these Imperial worlds. Life on the fringes of the Imperium had made these planets more pragmatic and less xenophobic when dealing with other races. The Tau started making trade agreements and then through subtle diplomacy found many of the human civilizations could be receptive to the prospect of a new future as part of the greater good, as an alternative to the oppressive rule of far distant terror. Watercast envoys whispered well-rehearsed words, planting the seeds of rebellion against the totalitarian imperial regime, and it was not long before many once faithful planetary governors were pledging their allegiance. The Tau Empire found it was able to peacefully expand into the area of space known to the Imperium as the Timbra subsector of the Segmentum Ultima. 
The Imperium of Mankind is a massive beast, hindered by bureaucracy and dogma. The loss of whole systems can easily pass unnoticed for decades, but eventually reports did start to filter back to the High Lords of Terror, of human worlds failing to pay their tithes, having fallen into the thrall of a Xenos race, and this sedition would not be tolerated. The unstoppable war machine of the Imperium was finally roused, and the Tau was soon facing a tyrannical and fanatical opponent, possessing seemingly limitless reserves of bodies, munitions, and terrifying engines of war the likes of which they had never encountered before. The Tau were designated as a highly dangerous Xenos species, and the Damocles Crusade was launched to purge them from the region. The vast Imperial forces were based around a dozen capital ships, and included 19 regiments of the Imperial Guard and five provisional companies of Astartes from a dozen chapters. The power of the Imperial fleet and the suddenness of their attacks led to a series of harrowing defeats for the Tau, who were swiftly driven back across the Damocles Gulf. The Imperial worlds that adjoined the Tau were subject to harsh recriminations, and what remained of their human population subjected to the wrath of the Inquisition for turning from the light of the Emperor. But the Tau themselves would not just be allowed to flee Imperial space without further reprisal for their slights against Imperial dominance. Using warp engine technology that was beyond the understanding of the Tau, the Cathedral ships of humanity crossed the Damocles Gulf in pursuit of their unprepared new foe. Soon their warriors were descending upon the Dalith Sept system, containing their first major planetary target, the prosperous and highly cultured planet of Dalith Prime. Dalith had been colonized during the first sphere expansion, and brought into compliance with prime level standards ever since. Its high numbers of water cast envoys meant it benefited from many favorable trade agreements, to hasten its development as one of the wonders of the Tau Empire. Formerly a wild ecosystem of azure foliage and segmented invertebrates, much of the indigo planet's surface was covered with a tessellating, hexagonal web of cities and subcities, interconnected by transit tubeways. In response to the encroaching grandiose armada, the Tau Navy scrambled what ships they could in response. But against the colossal Imperial vessels, the aircast fighters, and even their Manta missile destroyers and star tide class interceptors were hopelessly overmatched. The highly mobile Tau ships were able to mostly evade the Imperial firepower targeted against them, but their own weaponry was mostly ineffectual. Until battlecruiser fleets could arrive from the Corvatra Navy docks on the system's edge, Dalith Sept was on its own. The orbital defences of the outermost planet Prayen made some small measure of impact on the encroaching Imperials, but they soon bludgeoned their way through, and Dalith Prime was open for a full-scale invasion. The aircast of Dalith were inspired by a rousing speech given by Commander Farsight at Zephyr Peak as the Imperial fleet closed in. Led by his trusted ally from Arkunasa in Admiral Teng, the pilots of the Sept world would counterattack in force and take the greatest toll possible on the insurgent humans before they made planetfall. The Razorback fighters, Barracudas, Tiger Sharks, and Sun Shark bombers of the Tau fleet, supported by clouds of networked drones, formed a deadly overlapping matrix in the skies above Dalith and those Imperial vessels that successfully ran the Gauntlet of Fire were greeted by salvos of Sky Ray Seeker missiles from Earthbound Interceptor cadres. The Tau looked to have the measure of the cumbersome invading craft, until the strike cruisers in low orbit made their presence felt, and started bombarding the ground positions as Astartes gunship squadrons looked to smash aside the disciplined Tau formations and provide cover for the drop pod assault on the largest hexadome, Gelberin. 
Taking the large metropolis on the eastern seaboard would give the Imperials a commanding position, and Astartes from the Ultramarine's 8th Company, commanded by Captain Athos, began a drop pod assault that was further supported by gunships and bulk landers, bearing other members of their company, as well as Astartes from the Hammers of Dawn, Iron Hands, and Scar Lords. As the drop pods hurtled out of the skies, smashing through the hyperplastic of the Tau hexadomes, the speed and ferocity of the assault appeared to have the Tau forces caught unawares. However, Oshova was more prepared for this eventuality than the Marines initially realised, and with his battlesuit teams on board Manta missile destroyers, and his fire warrior support cadres loaded onto Magna Rail transmotives, the Tau response was swift. Tens of thousands of Tau troops converged on the positions of the Astartes, and with the crisis teams acting as a mobile vanguard, the marines were subjected to devastating bursts of plasma rifle fire that could punch through ceramite armour and augmented flesh with ease. Realising their position was untenable, Sergeants Numitor and Sicarius of the Eighth combined their remaining squad members and made an audacious plan to board an empty transmotive that was pulling away from the war zone. The hope was that its destination would be a Tau military barracks, and from there they could strike at the senior command personnel coordinating the city's defence. On board the Orca The Silent Aftermath, Commander Farsight was readying his XV-8 crisis suit when he was made aware of the security breach. He ordered the pilot to intercept the transmotive, determined that the covert strike team would not succeed in their mission. He reached the transport as it traversed Dalith's prime reservoir on a high mag rail, and Oshova first sent in gun drones to occupy the Astartes on board while he cut the link pistons between the transport cylinders and the rail beneath, causing the transmotive to jackknife and sending the rear portion plunging down into the reservoir as the Astartes scrambled to reach the front portion still on the track. Sicarius and the remains of his squad levelled a volley at the Crimson Warsuit as it leapt onto the roof of the transmotive and punched a lance of fusion energy into the transit cylinder, reducing another battle brother to a smoking ruin. Sergeant Numitor returned fire, his bolt rifle evading Farsight's force shield and detonating hard on the battle suit sending him off balance for a moment. This gave Sicarius an opening to swing his Talisarian blade towards their opponent's waist. Farsight deflected the blow with his shield only for Numata to hammer his power fist into his shoulder, ripping free the weapon arm from his suit. Oshova was flung back hard from the roof of the transport, and with his jetpack still suffering the effects of the disruptive energies of the power fist strike, he plunged into the waters of the reservoir below. As Farsight's battlesuit sank through the water, its limbs inert and sensor panels offline, Oshova struggled to salvage the data he could from his latest encounter with the Astartes. With the xv 8 wound sealant system shorted out, ice water started to enter through the twisted hole of the battlesuit's missing arm. If he could not get his systems back online in seconds, he would drown in the freezing depths. Oshova's XV-8 had dozens of improvements, including an advanced hazard suite devised by Ovesa, the nictating membranes that had been designed to seal off his jet vents from Arkunasa's rust particulates, had prevented the water flooding his engines, but they were still useless without power. Recalling an emergency contingency technique Ovesa had mentioned in passing, Farsight was able to override the subordinate register and turn it to base screen. He was able to punch in the last of the codes just as the freezing water reached his throat, and his body started to spasm involuntarily inside the control cocoon. The thrust vector suite flared into life, and he was able to use his directional jet to halt his descent into the depths and slowly reverse it into a gentle ascent before rerouting power from his missing fusion blaster to speed up his rise to the surface. Despite his dire circumstances, Oshova knew the Astartes would likely be waiting for him above to deliver the killing blow should he not drown. With little choice, he used his sensor array to detect their position before he erupted from the surface of the reservoir in a plume of water, sending an immediate volley of plasma rifle fire at the Astartes. 
Numitor ducked just in time, the shots taking another unfortunate battle brother in the chest as Farsight landed on the transport. Snatching up a malfunctioning drone to use as a shield, the sergeant fired his drunk pack and slammed into the crimson war suit. As the force field drone and the shield tech of the crisis suit crackled and filled the air with the acrid smell of burning electronics, neither combatant could land a solid blow until Sicarius again intervened. This time the sweep of his blade found its mark, cleaving the sensor array head of the battle suit in half in a shower of blue sparks. Suddenly there was a blazing flash of light so bright even the enhanced senses of the Astartes could not immediately compensate. By the time their vision returned, Farsight had made good his escape, rising vertically to meet an orca on an intercept course. Powerless to do anything else, Numitor could only watch as Farsight smoothly landed through the open bay doors, and made a gesture that looked strangely like a salute with his plasma rifle, before disappearing from view. Despite his escape, Farsight was far from out of danger. The pressure differential between the freezing depths of the reservoir and the aircraft was severe, and without proper decompression he would succumb within hours. He ordered the pilot to fly to the medical facilities at Anthra Dra, and completed his data compile before allowing the darkness of unconsciousness to take him. As Farsight recovered in the medical facilities of the Earth cast, he continued to study the footage of the Imperial invaders. He watched the drab, olive-green bulk transport of the Astra Militarum descending behind the beachheads on Gelberin City's borders. He saw the artillery columns forming up behind the advance of the massive Titanic walkers, and his desire for retribution built. Farsight was also paying close attention to the Imperial's war tongue, and although he did not possess the Watercast's innate skill with languages, pieces of their military cant were starting to fall into place as he readied his mind to take the field once more. Despite the military might amassing outside the city, the Tau counterattack had mostly scoured the Astartes from Gilbrin City itself. Over a hundred Battle Brothers had lost their lives in the first few hours of the invasion, the interlocking counter-assault already being touted by the water cast as indicative of Tau superiority over the humans. With aching joints and pain flaring across his still healing skin, Commander Farsight insisted on leading his battlesuit cadres as they made their way on board Orca transports towards the last of the Imperial insertion points. With the Imperial Command Center located, he was eager to return to the fray and assess the enemy's strength personally. Farsight had planned a vertical strike and had run through a number of simulations to maximize its effectiveness. Leading the battlesuit assault alongside Commander's Brave Storm and Bright Sword, he again urged his subordinates not to underestimate the Griron Shah, just as they broke from cloud cover into a hail of fire from the Astartes below. It would be in this engagement that Farsight would learn more about the apothecaries of the Astartes through an interaction with Antelok of the Hammers of Dawn. He had known for some time the medics of the Space Marines identified themselves by wearing white, but he had yet to determine why they attended their fallen brothers who were far beyond saving. He knew there must be a secret there he could use to his advantage. The proud Son of Dawn did not diverge any information when the massive Crimson War Suit descended on him, placed its energy rifle to his helm, and asked in stilted low gothic why the medic put himself in such a perilous position for one who could not be saved. However, Farsight surmised that the medic was engaging in a death ritual to recover something they considered vital. With the secret of the recovery of Gene Seed from the fallen mostly guessed correctly, Farsight removed the barrel of his gun from Antelok's helmet, and with a brief salute for the medic's bravery, Farsight shot back into the sky to rejoin the fray. Ahead, he saw Brightsword closing in on what he judged from their baroque armor and elaborate standard to be the officer class. For all Brightsword's bravery and skill, Oshova could see the peril the younger Tau commander would place himself in once the kill was made, and powered forward in support. Brightsword's fusion blasters cut through one officer and bisected the pole of the standard, causing its bearer to lunge forward to prevent the company banner touching the ground. A second blast took his life too, but the captain with his crested helm and iron halo was already reacting. 
Firing his own jump pack, the captain soared towards Brightsword and swung the massive great axe he carried in an arc that caught Brightsword's engine unit just as he made to leap from a gun rig platform. The Giron Shah commander pulled his axe free as Brightsword tucked into a somersault and brought his fusion blasters slashing up, severing the hand of the captain and causing the axe to fall. But without a moment's hesitation, the Astartes pulled free his pistol and fired a shot into Brightsword's sensor array, sending him reeling. As the young commander fought to regain control, the captain retrieved his power axe and ordered his marines to stand down as they began to open fire on the Tau in aid of their leader. Realising this was now an honour duel between the two, the approaching Farsight also held his fire. Oshova watched as the captain shoulder barged Brightsword to gain separation and invaded the beams of his fusion blasters with only a trailing edge of one catching the force field of his iron halo. This sent the marine officer hurtling back to brace feet first against the sheer wall of a transmission tower before boosting over the curving transmotive sweep rail adjoining it. As the captain had suspected, Brightsword was reckless in pressing home his attack and his trajectory forced him to go under the arch in pursuit of his opponent. Anticipating where the Tau commander would emerge, the Giron Shah captain swept a vicious overarm blow down into the oncoming battle suit that sent Brightsword crashing headlong into the ruins below, the great axe embedded deep in his plexus hatch. Farsight rushed towards his fallen young prodigy just as his distribution array showed Brightsword's icon turn the charcoal grey of death. Oshova had a clear shot on the captain's back, but despite the grief that welled up inside, the Tau would not take the shot. He watched as the captain tore his axe free, blood fountaining from Brightsword's torn suit, and turned to face him. Only when the captain bellowed another war cry and charged straight at Farsight, did he fire both his weapons at once, overloading the protective force field, cratering the Astartes chest in a mist of superheated blood. Captain Athos of the 8th Company had fallen. Despite the loss of Commander Brightsword, the mission was a success, and Oshova gave a speech to an assembly of the Tau commanding officers that was broadcast to the population of Dalith. So he could afford no sign of weakness as he gave greeting in the name of the Tau Var, and began his oratory under the watchful gaze of Arn Dreka, as two others, Arn Tifan and Arn Tipia, attended via hollow presence. Farsight warned they had encountered but a fraction of the enemy's strength, and that their ships disgorged more with each passing day despite the many successes of the air cast. As was his nature, he then praised the work of the Earth cast for the efficiency of their transmotive network, and the Water cast for the critical intelligence they had gathered in aiding the war effort. The casts, he said, fought in unison under the guidance of the Ethereals, and with the unbreakable shield of true unity, the invaders would be driven back, despite their strength in numbers. At these words, images were projected of the massed ranks of Imperial Guard marching from cavernous bulk landers on the outskirts of Galbraith City. Farsight highlighted the crude armament of the Astra Militarum foot sloggers, las guns with bayonets fixed, faces locked in waxy masks of contempt and ignorance. But the murmurs of assent changed to worried confusion as the first of the Titans came into view behind the Grula troops. Farsight looked to calm the assembled Tau, saying that although the god machines of the Imperials looked indomitable, they too could be overcome, as the footage changed to show the burning demise of one such engine, brought down by Manta missile destroyers. He then went on to warn of the threat of the Astartes, but made it clear that despite the potency of their weapons and the resilience of their armour, they were but few in number. Once deployed in a shock assault, these space marines were committed to that war zone, unless their air cover could retrieve them. By withdrawing the fire warrior cadres from such engagements swiftly, and with the air cast targeting their support craft, the Astartes could be left stranded, their strength mostly neutralised. He urged the Firecast officers to have their crisis suits fitted with plasma rifles and fusion blasters before engaging the Giron Shah, and recent aircast sweeps showed they had been all but repelled from Gerberenth City as cheers filled the auditorium. At this, Andrecker inclined his head, 
in a slight gesture of disapproval, and Farsight reinforced that the battle was far from over, despite their successes so far. The invaders had tens of millions to draw upon, and while the wider Tau Empire was already mobilizing to send forces to their aid, their task was clear. They had to study the enemy, stall their advance, divide their forces, and then bring down the sword again and again and again, until a new chapter in the ascendance of the Tau Var was written. The atmosphere in the room was tense with anticipation, until one loud, clear voice cut through the jubilation with a resounding no. A tall, athletic female Tau warrior strode into the hollow theatre. Atop her proud head, a mane of red hair was bound into a tight scalp lock that trailed in her wake like a serpent. It was held in place by metallic bands etched with symbols denoting major military victories and these bands were many. Commander Shadow Sun emerged into the light of the chamber, loping down to its center with the grace of a feline despite the bulk of her XV-22 battlesuit. Wisps of steam still rose from fusion blasters that had only just seen use. His old rival and fellow protege given the title O Shazira by Pure Tide himself strode to the command dais to stand in front of Farsight, her suit largely blocking him from view. The breach of etiquette was swiftly forgotten by her aura of confidence, and Andreka made the gesture for her to proceed. Oshazira said the time for talk was over. She said long-laid Kayun plans were in place on Dalith, and they should be enacted now. It was not the time to stall, but to act, to stop the slaughter of their people. The firecast reserves would be committed to the field. By relocating their forces to less populous areas, the Astartes would be drawn there, into traps of their devising, while reducing collateral damage. They would wage a mobile war, using the planet's rotation to keep their enemy literally in the dark. As mutters of assent interspersed with louder outbursts of approval, she outlined her plan to the commanders not directly under Commander Farsight, while he silently seethed behind her. Their relationship had soured many years ago, but he did not believe she would embarrass and contradict him so openly. Gone was the introspective strategist he had once admired, the patient huntress famous across the Empire for her cold and deadly deliberations. In her place was the vengeful avatar of the Code of Fire, desperate to enact the long-planned Kaeon against the invaders who dared to threaten the Septs of the First Sphere. Farsight told himself it was compassion that drove her to this course of action. His humiliation was just an unfortunate byproduct of her desire to save Tao lives, his wounded pride the collateral damage. As she swept from the chamber, a full half of the emergency conclave rose and left with her, already talking into headpiece comms beads to coordinate their forces, and for those that remained, the inspiration of his earlier words was lost. The commander's problems did not end there. Amongst his audience had been Tutor Sarcanthus, and he still burned for revenge on Oshova. Ever since mentoring the prodigy in the Montier Battle Dome, Sarcanthus had felt he posed a threat to the Tauvar itself, and now he saw the means to diminish Farsight even further. That route lay in declaring Farsight Vashar, a term that meant one between spheres, and greatly frowned upon by more traditional Tau who felt the caste system should be strictly adhered to at all times. He sought evidence to support his claim by questioning Ovesa shortly after the conclusion of the emergency council. While the Earth caste scientist had a prodigious intellect, he was honest to a fault, and completely naive in the ways of politics. Ovesa could not help but express his respect for Commander Farsight, and elaborate on this by retelling how he had saved himself from drowning during this very campaign. Restarting the waterlog battle suit under those extreme conditions was a feat beyond some members of the Earth cast. Too late did Ovesa realize he had been tricked into suggesting Farsight could indeed be seen as Vashar for such feats. And as the Earth cast scientist made his excuses, the wily Sarcanthus continued with the next phase of his plot. Commander Farsight turned his attentions back to the Imperial incursion, as determined as ever to prevail over the invaders. In the name of their emperor, the Imperial Invasion Force was throwing wave after wave at the beleaguered Tau defenders. 
Their Astartes launched shock assaults against several major cities in the Northern Hemisphere, each making significant gains and leaving the Firecast struggling to respond in time. Outside the city's Shadow Sun was fighting a guerrilla war to disrupt Imperial supply lines and hamper the advance of their armoured columns. Although the two never spoke directly, for his part Farsight supported her efforts with his own forces. The complementary strategies of Kaon and Montcar proving effective despite the lack of communication. In reality, the two knew each other so well they could predict each other's likely next move with unearing accuracy. The Imperials had success too. At Vimeshla, the Tau's hold on the war zone had finally been broken. Not by the feared Astartes or the monstrous engines of war, but by a simple bayonet charge by desperate guardsmen. Only one in six of the advancing humans made it into melee as they charged in the face of withering fire from the Tau defenders but those that did fought with a frenzy that overwhelmed the fire warriors behind their tied wall. While his personal cadre were trained in a close quarters doctrine after their experience on Arkunasa, the rest of the Tau military still saw it as a distraction from the true art of war, and at Var Meshla, they paid the ultimate price. Farsight began to see his grip on the Daloth operation weakening, and knew the Ethereals would reach the same conclusion. Farsight was interrupted in his reverie by contact by Ovesa, who urged the commander to join him as a matter of urgency. Despite himself having little in the way of empathy, the Earthcast scientist was terrible at hiding his emotions, and Oshova knew this must be of some importance. Not only did Ovesa have several prototype battle suits of immense size under construction to show his commander, but he also led him through a vestibule strangely devoid of the signage the Earthcast scientist loved so much. The whole area felt somewhat clandestine as Ovesa walked down a long corridor past blacked out windows that he tapped with his data wand to make them briefly transparent and blink capture the progress of the projects within. Farsight tried to act nonchalant while he snatched glimpses of the various prototypes until eventually he saw something he could not ignore. Behind one window was a series of tall glass cylinders, each holding a slumbering Tau, with tubes and wires emerging from its scalp, eyes and skin. The nearest one, although only around twelve years of age, bore a striking resemblance to Commander Brightsword. Farsight had to question what he had seen, and Ovesa revealed Brightsword had been voluntarily involved in his hypogenic program for years. The thought that his late prodigy had a maturing clone, with possibly a sentient mind prior to Brightsword's death at the hands of Captain Athos, disquieted Dashova greatly. Despite the rules prohibiting such a thing, Farsight knew the Earthcast genius saw only the goal of scientific discovery, and was unburdened by ethical consequences. Putting his mentor Oblatai into the artificial intelligence now known as War Ghost had proven that. What Ovesa truly wanted to share was twofold. First, he wanted Farsight to see footage taken from his labs that showed a small incursion force of Astartes that had broken in. First, they fought against a broadside. Then, they were challenged by a warband of cybernetic crute, a macro stealth suit, and finally, a ballistics unit of colossal size. Each challenge they overcame. Ovesa also warned that Tutor Sacanthus had been questioning if Oshova's gifts were spread too widely for the greater good, and fear briefly gripped the commander at the consequences of being declared Fasya once such a claim reached the Ethereals. However, he forced himself to focus instead on the goals of the Astartes. He quickly surmised they were heading for the Anthadra command facility, and although Shadow Sun had already been warned of their presence by Ovesa, Farsight knew he must warn the Ethereal Council that was meeting there. On his return, Oshova was escorted to the audience sphere of Daleth's subterranean hypercomplex to answer to the Ethereals Antipia and Antrifan. He tried to warn the Ethereal Guard that came for him about the need to reinforce Anthada, but they would not hear his pleas. Farsight transmitted the conversation surreptitiously in the hope that some of his allies would attend the hearing to come. On the way through the command complex, Farsight was led through the emergency medical facility where he discovered the fate of Commander Bravestorm 
Brave Storm had been recovered from the Black Thunder Mesa, where he and his Shavastres were field testing one of Ovesa's latest prototypes, the Onager Gauntlets. Black Thunder Mesa was a ridge of rugged cliffs that overlooked the Dao Ryu settlement, where many Tao training academies were situated. The area had been fiercely contested during the conflict, but had now been taken by the Imperial forces and their artillery were positioning to fire on Dal Rio below when Brave Storm's team struck. The Onager Gauntlets had proven massively effective as the Tau tore apart the Astra Militarum tanks with ease. Brave Storm's team had seen the two Warlord Titans positioned on the plain below the Mesa, but they had thought themselves safe from the God Machine's wrath while they were engaged with the forces on the ridge. They were wrong. The closer Titan opened up on their position, firing its laser blaster and apocalypse missile launcher indiscriminately, all but wiping out Bravestorm's team along with its own allies on the ridge. Although badly burned, Bravestorm himself survived the devastating salvo and made a suicidal charge against the behemoth doing significant damage before Mantha missile destroyers were able to close in and finish the job. Once led past the med labs and into the audience chamber, Farsight had an unexpected surprise that made his breath catch in his throat. Seated atop a dislike hover throne was a slender, elderly ethereal, scholar of the undying spirit, speaker of the great truths and shining light, the ethereal master Arn Var. Second only to the ethereal supreme, Arn Wei, was presiding over the hearing. Oshova was first accused of allowing alien invaders to establish a significant presence upon a primary sept world. Gelbrin itself, though initially cleared, had now been declared lost to the Imperial forces, as footage was shown of White Scar's bikers reaping a terrible toll on Fire Warrior and Battle Suit alike. Four other major cities had also fallen. Commander Shavastos attempted to interject in support of Oshova, stating the war was still in its opening phases, the gains Farsight had made against the Imperial forces and his personal heroism in battle. Aunt Tifan countered that despite these facts, a fifth of the planet's population had already been lost. They faced a brutal and merciless foe with arcane technology beyond their ability to counter and bolstered by an unshakable belief in their emperor. The Ethereal went on to say that all the commanders responsible for the defense of Dalith would face censure, although those in the field, including Commander Shadow Sun, would be exempt for the time being. She was tasked with hunting down the Giron Shah assault troops that were at large outside the designated war zones, and recalling her was seen as counterproductive. Antipia stated that Anvar would outline his plans for the defense of Dalith in due course, but first they would address the accusations of Vashya that had been levelled against the fated commander. Oshova was told the hearing had already determined the allegations made by Tutor Sacanthus had a basis in truth. Footage of his rallying speech at Zephyr Peak was found to have oratory techniques employed by the Watercast, and details of the field repair he conducted on his XV-8 at Dalith Reservoir had been assessed by Ovesa, who concluded it would be exemplary work for an Earthcast. In a member of the Firecast, it set a worrying precedent that could threaten the fabric of the Tau Var. Farsight could not contain himself any longer, asking if he should have allowed himself to drown and with him the wisdom of pure tide be lost. He also rounded on both his former tutor and with great hurt in every word his supposed ally Ovesa. Silence descended as Arnvar's disapproving gaze fell upon Oshova. There was something else there too the slightest hint of triumph. When Arnvar spoke, he said perhaps the key to victory was to be found in Pure Tide's wisdom, but in its totality, not in select parts bestowed on his pupils that suited their nature. Farsight was to go to his old master in exile and disgrace, and bring back his unsurpassed insights on the nature of war. The Ethereal turned to look directly at Oshova and exert the full weight of his authority on Farsight as he commanded him to take Ovesa's neural device, the same one that had created the war ghost from his old friend Oblatai, and use it to retrieve all of Pure Tide's knowledge, and if he completed this task, he could yet redeem himself, fail, and he would be put to death. Farsight was taken by Devilfish to the mountain path that wound up the tallest of Kanji's perilous peaks, 
just as a cold, thin rain started to fall. Ascending to the mountain, he found the ancient warrior Sage seated with his back to Farsight, cross-legged upon a simple hover throne, much the same as he had been on their first meeting. Master Puretide bade him to approach and turned his face to his former pupil. Puretide's face was craggy and scoured with deep lines of age. Eyes as hard as diamonds glinted under a noble brow. The master was older than any Tau Farsight had ever seen, but he still radiated unmatched strength of will. The old warrior said the years had been kind to his pupil, and he now had the bearing of a hero. Farsight replied if he had earned that accolade, it was only through the application of Puretide's wisdom, and the Firecast would be but a shadow of their current incarnation without his teachings. Oshova then pressed upon his master the dire circumstances of the war with the Imperial forces. Chided for his impatience, Farsight told his master it was not his wish, but it was the will of the Ethereals that brought him to seek his master's guidance once more. Pure Tide sat in silence, his face an unreasonable mask as the rain turned to tiny snowflakes that danced between the two. The Guila were here on Dalith, Farsight said, and with a determined push they could take this mountain and kill the old warrior where he sat. Desperately, he asked if his master even cared for victory any more. Still, the venerable Tau remained silent, as if the answer was obvious. Just as Farsight's anger was about to boil over, he finally spoke, but only to say if he was to die, it was because his time had come. Farsight said he could not allow Dalith to die with him, and swinging the satchel he carried from his back, he opened it to reveal Ovesa's prototype. He told Pure Tide he must wear the device, that it would capture his wisdom to be better distributed amongst the commanders of the Tau. Pure Tide said he knew the day would come when they came to take his mind. He just never expected it would be Oshova they sent to do so. Farsight made the gesture of the unworthy student and said he did not know their true intent. He only did the bidding of the Shazar Tor. The ancient Tao chided his former pupil once more, this time for bringing falsehoods before him. But with a stoic look on his face, he said his pupil should do as he must, in the name of the Tao Var. As he placed the jellyfish-like device on his mentor's bald pate, he could not help but remember the day the roles had been reversed, and the old master had traced the crown of the new commander on his head with a mixture of blood and ash. That had been a joyous day. This was anything but. Stealing himself, he pressed the discs of the device onto the neural sights, and Pure Tide looked at him, eyes swimming with sadness and regret, endless pools reflecting a soul bathed in decades of contemplation. Our race will walk dark paths one day, he said, and Farsight felt his heart shrivel in his chest. Just as he was about to press the activation node that would sink a tiny needle into Pure Tide's brain, the old Tao's hand shot out to grip his wrist and pull him close. Do not trust them all, my child, he whispered. Do not trust them all. And with that, Oshova pushed the node in with the faintest click, and Pure Tide's eyes rolled back, as white as the snow that still fell on master and student. On his return, the wisdom of Pure Tide was transferred onto biochips that were inserted into many of the Firecast's most prominent commanders. Commander Shavastos was one of those to volunteer to undergo the procedure that involved the top of his cranium being surgically removed before the biochip's tiny wires stretched out into his brain and his consciousness dwindled away. He saw it as the greatest honour to be made one with the wisdom of the great master Pure Tide to be faultless in the philosophies of war, the epitome of what the Firecast could achieve. It was a further honour that Arn Var was watching over his procedure in person, yet in his last moment, words arose unbidden to his lips. Do not trust them all, my child. Commander Shavastos, alongside the other implanted Tau commanders now known as the Swords of Pure Tide, would lead a series of counter-assaults against Imperial positions all across Dalith. Shavastos, in his personalised XV-85 Enforcer model crisis suit that was strangely no longer to his liking, would lead one such assault. The plan was simple, a blend of Kaon Trap and Montcar Blow that would have the Imperials at their mercy simply by way of their relative positioning. 
The commander had to suppress the urge to join the fight himself. There should be no real need, he reflected. Let the lower ranks make their mark this day. A true master of the Code of Fire achieves victory without drawing his blade. He would watch the slaughter from on high. Giving the code phrase, 12 teams of crisis and broadside suits sent missiles streaking from the rooftops on every side of the Imperial drop zone. To detonate on their quad-barreled gun emplacements, reducing all but one to twisted scrap. With the anti-air guns destroyed, the aircast could now play their part, as Admiral Tang directed Sunshark bomber squadrons to drop their payload of pulse bombs onto the dual towers that marked each of the compound's exits. There would be no escape and no retreat for the invaders. Shavastos watched as the Grilar troops scrambled to reach the higher ground of the rooftops, just as he had predicted. Without the support of their Giron Shah, the human infantry proved little challenge, and they were mowed down by the burst cannon of a concealed squadron of devilfish as he sprang his Kaon. Next, he ordered the broadsides armed with railguns to target the armoured fuel silos the Imperials had placed within their beachheads, the hypervelocity rounds punching through them with ease as they detonated violently, sending smoke and flames high into the air. All was going to plan until Shavastos heard the blood-curdling screams of his own troops. The inferno of the fuel silos were being twisted into tendrils of flame that seemed to have a life of their own as they swept across the crisis missile teams placed on the rooftops, reducing them to molten metal and bubbling flesh in seconds. The hammerheads he had closing in from the south were being sent tumbling through the air as if flung by an unseen hand. One smashed down onto his broadside missile team, causing further devastation. Shavastos searched the mind of Puretide for a tactic to counter this new threat, but he found nothing, and the situation was worsening as in a flare of amber light an assault terminator squad, armed with thunder hammers and storm shields, appeared on the roof where his railgun broadsides were positioned. Their hammers rose and fell, pulverizing the hulking battlesuits one after another. In mounting confusion, the commander saw a silvered Gilar Hellion rising towards him with no obvious means of propulsion. He raised his plasma rifle and fired what should have been a kill shot, but it had no effect on the strange being. Nor did the supporting fire of his bodyguard, and soon the witch was amongst them, smashing aside drones and tearing off battlesuit limbs with ease. Shavastos had no option but to boost Airborne to escape the metal-skinned anomaly. His mind burned as he raced through endless tactics and stratagems, but nothing seemed to apply to the foe they faced. Everywhere he looked, the tower were being butchered. His subordinates cried out for orders as pain seared through his mind, pulled in a hundred directions at once. All he could do was hit his emergency protocol pad and veer away into the sky, as his officers desperately implored him for direction, but neither Shavastos nor Puretide could reply. The battle was far from over for the Imperial forces. The gambit of Sergeant Numitor that the Tau would be unprepared for psychic warfare had proven correct, and the effects had been devastating. The carnage of the Primaris Psyker Vokola Harat and the other psychers that accompanied the 122nd Belgast Castellans was almost disturbing. Despite their victory, their Imperial Guard contingent had been taken apart in a matter of minutes by the initial tower assault. And from the report of the librarian Alexis who accompanied the Terminator assault team, the same had been repeated across the planet. Alexis and his brethren in the first company were still dispatching the last of the heavy weapons war suits when they were fired upon by a team of gun drones. Their volley of plasma rifle fire targeted the librarian, and Alexis was thrown from the roof as he was struck three times. The aircast bombers were also returning to rain death on them once more. Without Alexis, the first company veterans were trapped in their exposed position, and even the tactical dreadnought armor they wore had its limits as one by one they started to fall. It was in this moment two things occurred. First, the Psyker Darapur revealed what she knew of the castes of the Tau to Sergeant Sicarius. There was a fifth caste they had not yet encountered. These beings ruled over the other castes and their word was law. 
His fellow Sergeant Numata was concerning himself with saving the remaining first company. He made for the last remaining Icarus quad gun and fired on the bombers closing in close formation, thinking all air cover had been neutralised. In a matter of seconds, all three aircraft were sent blazing from the skies. The tower assault was finally over, and their fortification was the only one to have survived. The outpost would be rebuilt, and despite his wounds, Alexis was able to confer with Numator and Stormseer Sudabare of the reinforcing Scar Lords on how best to exploit the tower's blind spot for arcane warfare. Numator led sorties to reclaim two further fortification zones from the tower and had just returned when the command squad of Captain Athos arrived by Storm Raven. They came bearing the standard of the 8th Company, and soon the assembled Ultramarines would be addressed by a hologram of their chapter master, Marnius Augustus Calgar, the Lord McCrag. Lord Calgar came before them with tragic news. He confirmed that Captain Athos had been slain by a Xenos war suit, but only after emerging triumphant in an honour duel with one of the champions of their warrior caste. Kalgar went on to praise one amongst them who took the fight to the Tau High Commander within hours of making planet fall. His squad had uncovered the great weakness of their foes to the powers of the mind that had led to victory, not only at this fortification, but was now being repeated across the theatre of war. He called forward Sergeant Numata to the command podium and elevated him to Captain of the Eighth Company, and with it the title of Lord Executioner and the massive great axe that was wielded by Captain Arthas before his death at Farsight's hand. Kalgar praised the 122nd Baelgath Castellans, saying Elixus had personally vouched for their valour in protecting him when he fell. He also imparted that he had received knowledge of the fifth ruling cast of the Tau through Elixus, although the warrior who made this discovery had wished to remain anonymous. Mind scries by the librarian had confirmed this information to be sound. The Lord McCrag gave orders they were to locate and eliminate the members of this fifth caste. This could be key not only to victory on Dalith, but in their war against the whole Tau Empire. Kalgar was then interrupted in his address with a troubled look and a nearly inaudible question to an unseen advisor. All Numata could discern was his lord asking how close this bio fleet was and how long did they have. Addressing Captain Numata directly, Kalgar repeated his order to take the forces assembled here and find and eliminate the members of the fifth cast swiftly before he ended the transmission. Having returned from Mount Kanji with the neural crown containing the totality engram of Pure Tide's mind, Farsight had been allowed to return to his command. It appeared Anvar considered the matter of his dedication to the tenants of the Tauvar proven, and the accusation of being Vashya laid to rest. The commander travelled on the Orca the Silent Aftermath, now painted red in the same manner as his armour, to rendezvous with his ally Commander Shavastos. He had heard worrying rumours about the mindset of his old friend, and the words of Pure Tide still gnawed at his consciousness. The idea that all of the ethereal cast could not be trusted would have been unthinkable before, but coming from his mentor, the wisest of all the warrior cast, it was a train of thought he could not dismiss. He knew in his heart the colour of his armour and ship no longer represented the blood of the fallen on Akunasa. It was now him asserting his own identity and authority at a symbolic level. He was a pupil of Pure Tide, not one of the engram implanted swords of Pure Tide. The majority of Oshova's fellow Shazo had gladly volunteered for the procedure, but he had declined. The idea that a simple act of surgery could in some way compare to the wisdom he, Oshazira, and Okase had received from the master himself disquieted him. There was a difference between the intelligent application of principles and the direct imitation of past experience no matter how successful. It had borne the hallmarks of disaster, and from what Farsight had now been hearing, his instincts had proven correct. Those whose minds had assimilated the neurochip had found their original personalities driven to the background by the iron will of pure tide. Ovesa was unquestionably an innovative genius, but the commander had known he had at best a tenuous grip on the concept of morality. The Earthcast scientist was so preoccupied with whether he could that he didn't stop to think if he should. Despite all his faults, Farsight found himself becoming increasingly fond of the open and honest.
Adonis del Versa. The prototypes the scientist and the war ghost that was once Oblatai would be accompanying Oshova on his next mission, and Oversa was closing swiftly to meet him. In fact, he had used the opportunity to test modified stealth fields, and despite not appearing on the Orca's sensor array, Ovesa's massive Earthcast builder ship soon loomed through the clouds. They made their way together to the Anthadra Command Facility, a complex of five hexagonal structures each representative of the five casts. On their approach, communication was received from Arn Tifan, the Ethereal confirmed that Farsight would not be attending a strategic council. Instead, he would be entering the fray once more. The Imperial forces were making a concerted push from the south towards Andrada, with the Gironshar leading the way. The Ethereal personnel and the high-ranking members of the other castes, with the exception of the Firecast, were being evacuated. Admiral Teng was leading the Aircast on an interception course alongside any commanders already in the field. Antifan admitted that the Swords of Pure Tide had been found wanting despite their initial success. The Swords had proven to be too predictable. Farsight replied that while the strict doctrine of the Space Marines was something that could be exploited in the future, it must be matched against the tenets of the Code of Fire with adaptability. The Ethereal shared the concern the ruling caste had about the Imperial's deployment of warriors with abilities that defied logic and categorization. The Earthcast were calling the powers of the Psykers Gulach, Mind Science. And while the Tau were not completely unfamiliar with the Arcane, the weaponized nature of these powers was new to them. She conceded that it appeared Commander Pure Tide had never encountered these techniques of war, and this cognitive dissonance had caused the malfunction of the Pure Tide engrams, causing catastrophic losses. Anvar had ordered the devices to be rescinded immediately, and many of the swords of Pure Tide were already in the custody of the Earth cast. Unfortunately, the removal of the neural chips had not been without incident. Antifan said there were reinforcements incoming from five other septs, but stressed that the humans must not become aware of the evacuation. The safety of the Ethereals was paramount, and with the Swords of Pure Tide found wanting, Farsight was to take overall command for the rest of the Dalith war effort. Ovesa would provide any prototypes he felt were battle-ready to support his efforts. As the Ethereal patched out, Farsight saw his distribution array displayed the symbol of Ovesa, and that of the crude shaper Karaktor Prok. Admiral Teng's symbol was also displayed, and Oshova briefly acknowledged his trusted friend just as a new symbol flashed on his screen, that of Commander Shadow Sun. Taking a moment to compose himself, he received her communication and asked her plans for the forces under her command. Shadow Sun, her gaze cold and severe, said her cadres were in position to strike at the ground assets she had appended to her transmission. Farsight sought to build bridges between the two, calling them the true swords of pure tide, and although she seemed to agree the surgical procedure masterminded by Anvar dishonored their master's legacy, she was quick to blame Ovesa rather than the ethereal master. He pressed on that the fact remained the majority of their commanders were now incapable of leading, and it fell to them to uphold the honour of the fire cast. At this she fell silent, the closest he would get to true agreement. He knew her well enough to see the pain in her eyes behind her stoic mask. Shadowson revealed that she had met with one of her former comrades after the chip's extraction. The commander had been left but a shadow of her former self, perhaps worse than an infant. The truth seeped into Farsight's heart like a toxin to be pumped through his veins until they burned. He felt his rage building uncontrollably, his face twisting into a snarl as he spat out the need for the Ethereals to be punished. They had taken the best and brightest of the Firecast for their failed experiment and then cast them aside as if they were nothing his friend Shavastos amongst them. Then his emotions truly overcame him as a dark realization sunk in. It was his fault. He had taken the engram of their master. He had been the tool of their demise. He closed his eyes, and when they opened, they were rimmed with red. What had he done? It was now a Shazira's turn to show compassion. She said he was ordered to take that course of action, no soul in the entire Empire would have acted differently. Shadowson said they must believe in the wisdom of the Ethereals and their shared destiny. 
but now more than ever those words rang hollow. Despite his misgivings, Farsight forced himself to focus on the task in hand and his duty to his people. They walked in dark times, and Shadow Sun repeated her belief that although their leaders may take them through shadows, only through unity would they emerge into the light. To take any other path would risk a return to Montal, the time of terror before the arrival of the Ethereals. They would both do their duty, and he thanked Ushazira for her counsel before the link was cut. Commander Farsight took flight in his XV-8 battle suit as they approached the five hex towers of Anthrada. Ovesa's vast ship circled around to the macro drop site beyond, with Admiral Teng's Barracuda squad acting as an escort. While of similar design aesthetic, the five towers were of different dimensions. They were largely representative of each of the castes and sported individual embellishments to match the role each played in the Tau Var. The five were connected by a sweep rail with node stations to allow passengers to disembark into the towers themselves. The symbolism was clear, the castes united by communication, technology, and common purpose. When Farsight landed in the complex, he was greeted by the welcome sight of Commander Shavastos. Less so was that of Tutor Sacanthus. It was Sacanthus who spoke first, and when he did, it was with contrition. He admitted trying to hinder Farsight in his career. He allowed his wounded pride to cloud his judgment, and in doing so, he acted against the Tauvar. Worse still, by undermining the trust of the people in their chosen hero, his actions had led to the loss of many of their caste's finest warriors to the failed Engram program. The old tutor continued that he now sought to atone for his mistakes. He asked Oshova to bestow upon him a new name and allow him to take the role of Monat, to seek redemption or death alone. Farsight was taken aback. The occasion dictated he graciously forgive his old teacher and allow him to redeem himself fighting alongside the commander and the other remaining fire cast. Even though he knew his actions would be closely watched, he determined the protocol and politics could be damned. He granted the tutor's wish, taking from him his former name and title and giving him the name Shakovash, fire's worthy cause. He was to return to Galbarin and descend into the Magna Rail tunnels as a monat. There he was to fight against the Giron Shah his people knew as the Scar Lords. He was to kill as many as possible, defeat them all, and he would earn his atonement. It was a death sentence the tutor accepted gladly. Commander Shavastos too was contrite, but Farsight said their discussion could wait just as another familiar voice came over the Kadra net. Commander Bravestorm. With a thud, a massive Iridium crisis suit landed behind Oshova, and with small amount of gallows humour, Bravestorm force-patched a live feed to what lay behind the thick armour of his plexus hatch. Farsight saw the charred ruin of what remained of Bravestorm, and realised the XV-8 he piloted was as much a life-support machine as a battle suit. He urged Bravestorm to take a terrible toll on the Imperials for what they did to him and his command of Black Thunder Nessa. The High Commander then turned his thoughts to the wider battle to come once more. His decoys were in place. The Imperial Tank Column, 146 vehicles strong, had left Galbarin and was approaching at impressive speed. Soon they would reach the first of Shadow Sun's Kaon traps inside the transmotive sweep rails. The Land Raiders of the 8th Company were targeting the Overland transmotive tunnels with their LAS cannons weakening their integrity so the artillery shells of their rolling siege guns could break each in turn, allowing the Imperial Column to pass through without stopping. Shadow Sun would soon halt their advance, and the trap would be sprung. But Farsight realised something was amiss. In all his encounters with the Astartes, they had manned the guns of their vehicles themselves. He did not believe the brave to the point of reckless space marines would all seek cover within their vehicles. He realised it was a decoy, it was the Tau that were falling into a Kaon. Sure enough, Shadow Sun reported that her forces had been intercepted by teleporting elite warriors and were being forced to fight for their lives without springing their ambush. Admiral Tang was next to relay that at least 30 airborne Imperial craft were converging on Athrada from three different directions. But all was not well for the Astartes either. Just as the strike was about to begin, Chapter Master Kalgar gave Captain Numator new orders. A worldwide evacuation was to begin immediately. 
the battle group invasion was to withdraw entirely and attend a fleet muster at Brimlock. Numata protested that they were poised to strike at the Tau Command Echelon, but Kalgar was insistent. A major alien incursion was encroaching on Ultramar. On its current heading, it would first reach Prandium, jewel of their empire, and then on to McCraig itself. They were to make haste to the coordinates he was sending, and from there make the warp jump to Ultramar's core ward, Mandeville Point. Dalith and the Tau could wait. McCrag could not. Captain Numato weighed up his options. To continue the attack having received the order to withdraw would risk the highest censure. To pull out now would leave many brothers and the supporting Astra Militarum elements stranded without support. The resulting gene seed retrieval would take longer and cost more lives than securing a swift victory. He made up his mind and ordered the drop assault to commence. The three-pronged air assault forced the Tau to spread their fighters too thinly to prevent all the Imperial craft reaching their target. While on the ground, the Tau's efforts to stop the armoured column were also mostly ineffectual, as the Astra Militarum transport simply peeled away from the main column and ploughed on at full speed as the lead vehicles were immobilised. On their descent, Numitor and Sicarius recognised the familiar shape of Ovesa's massive battle suit perched atop the highest tower. This time it was supported by six further teams of artillery suits, three with long-barrelled rail rifles, the others with boxy missile arrays. They were already reaping a terrible toll on the approaching armoured convoy. Numitor ordered Sergeant Kiniston of the Balegas Castellans whom he had fought alongside in the victory at the fortification site, to disembark and send empty chimeras forward on autodrive to distract the support war suits, and they would do the rest. Kinnison said there was no time to disembark, and with pennants streaming, the brave men and women of the 122nd Balegath Castellans drove straight at the position of their titanic war suit, the heavy bolters and multi-lasers of their chimeras having little effect as their giant returned fire, with its massive shoulder cannon erasing two chimeras from existence. The other Chimeras veered to the side, allowing a squadron of Lehman Russ behind to open fire with their battle cannons, raining shell after shell on the behemoth. When the smoke and dust cleared, the massive construct still stood. Missiles streaked from the artillery warsuit to top the roof towards the stricken column, but before they reached their target, a tiny figure emerged from one of the languishing Chimera and called forth a wall of flame that caused them to detonate harmlessly in flight. On Numesta's orders, Storm Ravens targeted the roof-mounted railgun emplacements on the south side of the tower, with strike missiles causing them to topple into the Tau infantry that was fanning out below. It would take the sacrifice of his Thunderhawk gunship to bring down the Goliath suit, its turbo laser destructor striking the battle suit true to punch through both its head and chest and out the other side, but not before it fired its own macro missile that struck the Thunderhawk's nose cone, annihilating its tech marine and his co-pilot instantly, and sending it hurtling into the squat hexagonal tower. The resulting explosion of its reactor core consumed every tau, drone, and battle suit positioned on its roof. As the Eighth were in freefall towards their designated positions, the pressure wave of the exploding Thunderhawk struck them and caused them to temporarily lose formation. It was at this moment they saw Farsight entering the fray, bounding across the rooftops accompanied by a cluster of war suits. Ordering their squads to follow, Sicarius and Numata changed course to intercept the Crimson Armoured Commander. Some of Farsight's honor guard rose to intercept the jump pack marines in a furious aerial duel, while the rest remained on the roof of the hex tower that bore the emblem of their warrior caste with their commander. Despite taking losses and being drawn further from their primary target, the Astartes prevailed, but as Numitor and his command squad crested the lip of the tower, they were greeted by a barrage of plasma that vaporized three of their number instantly. Captain Numitor was struck three times, the iron halo dissipating the first two volleys, only for the third to find its mark, and send him crashing awkwardly to the rubble-strewn ground, his great axe spinning from his grasp. Farsight loomed over the fallen captain and leveled the barrel of his plasma rifle at Numitor's head. Disappointing, he said in an accented low gothic. 
At that moment, Sicarius and his squad descended to save their captain. Hacking and slashing at Farsight's bodyguards like furious beasts, they drove the crisis suits back until Farsight fired his jetpack and soared up into the darkening sky, towards the tallest hex tower, with Sicarius and his squad in close pursuit. Numitar was hurt but not incapacitated, and retrieving his great axe, he too leaped into the night. On his ascent, Numata was joined by his former squad, and this time he would not repeat the same mistake that cost him his command squad. The captain ordered his assault marines to hold back, and throw frag grenades onto the roof. This time there was no wall of plasma. The red-suited commander stood alone, twenty feet in front of Sicarius, who had adopted a stance he quickly recognised as that of a Talassarian honor duel. Farsight had two contingency plans in place, but there was no way the Code of Fire would allow him to refuse the obvious challenge to single combat. This was Tau versus Human, the greater good versus the Imperium of Man, contrasting ideologies crystallised as two avatars of war. Your name, Bladesman. Sergeant Cater Sarkarius of Talasar, Ultramarine's 8th Company. I am called Shazo, Viola, Shova Kesmontia, Commander of the Second Sphere. Meaningless noise to me, alien. I will take your head for the Imperium and those of my brothers you have killed. Then you may call me Death. With honor pendants fluttering behind him, Farsight sprinted forwards, raising his rifle and firing a twin blast of plasma towards the Astartes' champion. Sicarius dodged aside as Farsight as anticipated, and the Tau swept his fusion blaster towards his opponent's legs, only for him to fire his jump pack and power over the beam. The Astartes' leap took him level with the XV-8's head, and he kicked hard, almost tearing the sensor array free, and causing the screens of Farsight's control cocoon to glitch for a brief instant. Anticipating the sword strike that would follow, Farsight raised his shield and eye-flicked its field to maximum to deflect the blow and the combatants separated briefly. Sicarius raised his plasma pistol and fired as he carved a figure eight with his blade. Farsight's field generator flared to dissipate the plasma bolt, and in the minute lag that followed, the blade bit deep into the torso and thigh of his suit. Farsight staggered backwards and lashed out with a kick that sent the Astartes skidding across the white marble roof as the commander leveled his plasma rifle and fired. But Sicarius was already boosting back at him, and the deadly bolts flew wide. His adversary fainted one way before bringing his glowing blade down on the barrel of the rifle, cleaving it in two. A straight kick to the plexus hatch followed, and Farsight had to fire his jetpack to avoid falling on his back. The human warrior pressed home his attack, but his plasma rifle failed to fire, and Farsight had a reprieve. The Giron Shah swung his blade in an overhand strike just as Farsight brought his fusion blaster up in a warding sweep aimed at his opponent's head. The blow was mistimed, and the beam only succeeded in connecting with the sword blade that could not withstand the shearing energy as the top part clattered onto the roof. Without pause, Sacarius drove his knee into Farsight's shield to force its pulse, before ramming the broken sword through the vision slit of the XV-8. Inside the control cocoon, the blackened tip stopped a fraction before it would have taken Farsight's life, and then all around them erupted in chaos. Believing his commander slain, Bravestorm had dropped into the combat heedless of the odds against him. With him was a battle suit that was unmistakable. It belonged to Commander Bright Sword, its fusion blasters with long tapering energy beams that appeared permanently active as he cleaved through one of the assault marines with ease. Farside knew immediately it must be the clone he had seen in Ovesa's lab, but there was no time for that now. Despite his reprieve, the Tau was still outnumbered three to one. Numata gave the immediate order to attack as he swung the Lord Executioner's axe in a wide arc towards Bright Sword, as the Tau cut down yet another of Squad Sicarius. Bravestorm intercepted the blow and swung his massive fist that crashed against the field of the Iron Halo, sending the captain stumbling back, temporarily blinded by the energies unleashed. 
His vision cleared just in time to avoid the next blow, and ducking under, he kicked out at Bravestorm's knee before his counter-strike tore loose the shield arm from the battle suit. Oshova saw the Astartes were on the cusp of victory, and he must enact his plan. Despite their protestations, he ordered Bravestorm and Brightsword to disengage and clear the area, while he called in drones for suppressive fire, and ordered the hidden Krut kindreds to climb from their positions. The drones laid down a storm of pulp rifle fire that forced the marines low, and brought his fellow commanders the time they needed to make good their retreat. Farsight was alone again as the Astartes turned to face him. He kicked the manual release of his suit's access hatch, and ordered El Vesa to initiate his part in the plan. From the Earthcast tower came a massive electromagnetic pulse. The purple-hued hemisphere expanded out across the complex, leaving nothing but darkness in its wake. Numata was about to fire his jump pack to leap forward and deliver the death blow to the commander, just as the crackling violet wave washed over the roof. He realised all his armour's systems had shorted out completely. He could barely take a step forward as all around the machine spirits of their battle plate fell dormant. His rising disquiet only increasing as he saw the avian heads of two dozen Krut hauling themselves onto the roof. With great effort, the captain freed his bolt pistol from its holster and raised it to fire, but even it did not respond. Nimble talons removed his helm and an instant later a razor-sharp blade was being pressed against his throat, with just enough pressure to draw blood. The Krut needed no war tech to be efficient killers. Farsight emerged from the hatch of his warsuit, landing gracefully in a hunter's crouch. He stood slowly and bowed without taking his eyes from Numitor. The captain expected to see an expression of triumph on the Tau's face, but instead he saw what appeared to be sadness etched there. In strangely lilting low gothic, Farsight offered to parley, and although he would not have his crew stand down, he ordered them not to strike first. Oshova would go on to say that despite the great damage done to Dalith, he respected the skill and strength the Astartes had shown here. Sicarius defiantly called the Tau faithless bastards, and one day they would be put to death in the name of the Emperor. Farsight countered that faith was indeed a powerful force, and that the Tau had their own, one in their mutual destiny that would not be denied, rather than in one of their number raised to godhood. Numata cautioned the commander not to talk of such things, as though it may cost him his life, he would end Farsight's first. Oshova questioned the honour of attacking an unarmed opponent, and putting the lives of his brothers in unnecessary danger. Sicarius questioned what Farsight knew of honour, only to be told that the Tau have their own warrior code, and once honour is broken, it cannot easily be repaired. For example, he said, it would be dishonourable to allow the white-armoured medics of the Astartes to be hunted down, and their ritual flask ground into the dirt. That would be a stain on his soul Farsight could not erase. Numitor struggled to keep his composure at that veiled threat to their Primarch's legacy as Farsight continued. He knew they'd been given the order to evacuate, so perhaps such extreme measures would not be necessary. Now it was Sicarius who spoke. He asked if they agreed to withdraw, would the commander simply allow every man and vehicle to leave Dalith? Farsight gave his word this would be true, and this time Sicarius did not grunt in disbelief, and he ordered his squad to stand down. Farsight ordered the crew to release their captives. The Astartes were now under the shield of truce, and would be allowed to return to defend their homeworld. With the Imperial's withdrawal, Commander Farsight has an important victory, but his tale is far from over. I hope you'll join me for the next part, and that I've earned your subscription today. And I'll see you again in the near future, where there is only war.